And now it's with great pleasure I welcome to the podium our 2025 Rose Hallman commencement speaker, Dr. Jeff Reedy. Jeff, the podium is yours. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a real honor and a privilege to be able to speak to you today. Again, my name is Jeff. I'm a 1996 graduate. Shout out to my brothers from Delta Sigma Phi, by the way. There we go. Right, now I was in computer science, so just to frame it, back then there were three professors in computer science. We were tucked away in the basement of the library, not connected to everything else, and there were 12 of us at the school. Um, so things have changed a little bit since then. Now, a couple months ago, when President Coons asked me if I would give this address, of course I said yes, because how often are you going to get an opportunity to do something like this? But then reality set in, which I actually had to think of something to talk about. So I did exactly what you guys would do in this situation, which is I went to ChatGPT, <laughs> and I asked it, what kind of things do people usually talk about during a commencement speech? And this is what it said. It said, by far the most common theme was to talk about how it was the duty and responsibility of the graduates to lead and to create the future. And I thought, oh my gosh, who wants to hear that load of crap, right? <laughs> so, you know, maybe if this were a big university with a whole bunch of different majors and all kinds of people, you have to talk about something so generic and obvious as to be like that. But it didn't sound very Rose Holman-like to me. So the good news is that is not what you're going to hear today. Yeah, there you go. Applause for that, right? There you go. Right, so instead, I started reflecting on what it was that brought me to Rose so many years ago, and it actually came down to two things. The first is something that happened when I was a senior in high school. I was visiting colleges with my parents. We were on a road trip, and if I remember correctly, Rose was the third stop on this particular trip. And I really wasn't looking forward to it. I wasn't having a lot of success in visiting any of these campuses. So I came to campus, I met with admissions, then I took the tour like many of you guys did. And what stood out to me on that tour as we were walking around and, and saw the classrooms is I noticed in all of the classrooms they had these big black computers. Now we didn't use laptops back then, so just imagine every class that you guys went to, there's a giant workstation sitting in front of you. And I'd never seen this kind of computer before. They were called Next Computers. Now you may not know, but Steve Jobs was once kicked out of Apple by the board of directors, and while he was gone, he started this company, Next Computer, and the tour guide saw that I was interested in these things, and they let me play with one. And when I did, I felt like I was seeing the future. It was so cool. And it relit this spark, it brought back this feeling that I had the very first time that I ever built a computer. I was in the third grade, and I built it with my dad. He brought home parts from his work. It was an IBM PC clone in 8086. And when we finished building this thing, I proudly named him Mr. Chips. Now my dad is here with us today and undoubtedly remembers not only building Mr. Chips, but also photocopying entire books on programming and how to use a computer that he brought home and kept feeding that spark. And that's how I taught myself how to code and, and all that kind of stuff. So that connection back to that next computer is one of the things that actually brought me here. The second is that I knew before I ever came to college that I wanted to start a company before I graduated. Now it may seem like Rose wouldn't be the place that you would go to to do that, but I had this theory that if I went to a small and concentrated place, I'd have more access to resources to achieve that goal. And it turns out I was correct. As a freshman, I met one of those other 11 computer science majors, Scott Loftmiller, who also, it turns out, wanted to start a company. Not only did we become good friends, but Scott is my co-founder across all of my companies 29 years since then. We also met Dr. Tom Mason. Now, Dr. Mason was a professor of economics, and he taught at the time what was the only class at Rose that touched on the subject of entrepreneurship. It was cleverly called The Entrepreneur, a 300-level econ class. Scott and I took that class together, and we worked with Dr. Mason and we told him that we were really interested in actually starting a company, and he encouraged us to pursue that goal. In fact, when the class was done, he created an independent study course that Scott and I also took together. And it was in that class that we wrote our first real business plan. And that business plan became the business we launched while we were seniors. 
It was the first internet service provider here in Terre Haute. Now, while I had this idea of being an entrepreneur, the spark that got me started in entrepreneurship actually goes back much, much earlier than that. And I can actually remember the moment in time quite vividly when it happened. I was in the first grade, and I was at a friend's house on a Saturday morning watching cartoons. Now back then, we didn't have YouTube, of course, or anything like that, so programming was very limited. So the way that it worked is on Saturday morning, the stations would show cartoons. Around 11.30, there'd be a short newscast, and then it switched over to sports in the afternoon. So that Saturday morning, we were sitting there watching cartoons. The news came on, and as a couple of eight-year-olds, we weren't particularly interested in the news, but I suddenly had this idea. I thought, if we watch the news, maybe we could write our own newspaper and sell it to everybody who hadn't yet seen the news. I know, right? So my friend Jennifer Wheeler and I decided we were going to give this a try, and we wrote a one-page, one-article newspaper covering the robbery of a convenience store, which had happened the night before, complete with a stick figure illustration reenacting that very scene. Now, when we were done, I, we very excitedly went to the neighbor's house, knocked on the door, and a woman answered the door, and we asked if she wanted to buy our newspaper. And she said yes, and she gave us 50 cents for that newspaper. And at that moment, I was hooked. And I wasn't hooked because of the 50 cents. I was hooked because an hour earlier, we had nothing. Then we had an idea. We created something out of thin air, and that something had value. Now, maybe it wasn't the value that we actually thought it was going to be, but actually a lot of businesses work that way. But I knew right then that I wanted to continue to create stuff like this. In fact, I knew I wanted to create a business that made cool stuff, stuff that solved problems and stuff that made people happy. And so it was the combination of those two sparks, my interest in computers and software, and the idea that I could come here and learn some things that would help me start a company. So let's bring this back to where you guys sit today. You guys are sitting right where I was 29 years ago. You finished a Rose Holman education, that's no small feat. You've done all kinds of things. You've navigated the fast-moving trimester system, the daily grind of a schedule that felt more like a high school schedule than a college, and you've done more than your fair share of math. Now, admittedly, some of you probably did love that math. I, for example, love differential equations, too, so much that I took it twice. <laughs> it's a true story. Right, now, most of you probably found along the way that things could get pretty hard. You told your classmates it was hard. They told you it was hard. In fact, I'm guessing most of the parents here have gotten text messages and phone calls describing how hard it is. Probably most of the aunts, uncles, cousins, Grandparents have heard stories about how hard it is. In fact, there's so much talk at Rose about how hard it is, it begins to take on almost mythological proportions. But let me let you in on a little secret. Some of you had friends that went to other science and engineering schools. Maybe they went to that well-known, if not somewhat overrated school up the river in West Lafayette. Maybe they went to Carnegie Mellon or Caltech or any number of other great schools. And do you know what they learned when they took thermodynamics at that school? They learned thermodynamics, just like you did. And when they took differential equations, what did they learn? Yeah, they learned differential equations, just like you did. And guess what? It was hard. Because science and math and engineering are hard subjects. They're not uniquely more difficult because you take them in Terre Haute, Indiana. But what's different here is it's the only majors that we have. Right, so you end up in this kind of echo chamber where everybody's always talking about how hard it is. But that doesn't make Rose any different. Right, when you were in high school and you were looking at colleges, my guess is you didn't stumble upon Rose Holman and think, finally, I found a place that would be really hard. <laughs> right, that, that's not why I came. Right, that's not why I came. So what I want you to do right now is to think back to your earliest memory that got you started down this path. What was it? that first drew you to science or engineering or creating things, doing research, whatever it may be. Maybe it was playing with Legos, maybe fixing a flat tire on your bike, maybe you had a great teacher somewhere along the way in math or science, maybe it was playing Minecraft. Like, whatever it was, it was to a, whatever it was to a neutral observer looking at that activity, it probably looks a lot like work. Right? Snapping Legos together might have been fun to you, but if you think about it, it's sort of a monotonous, repetitive task. 
And if you've ever watched anyone play Minecraft, if you're not really into it, the whole thing seems ridiculous. You spend hours running around gathering materials so you can build some giant structure that no one's ever going to see and actually doesn't really have any bearing on the game. But you guys like doing it, and it was fun, and it wasn't necessarily easy, right? You made mistakes, you had to learn, you'd get a little better, but it was fun, and it wasn't like roller coaster riding fun. It was the kind of fun that you experience when you take on a difficult task and you beat it. The kind of fun that you experience when you create something that wasn't there before. And whatever that was, that was your spark. And you brought it here. That's what makes Rose different. There was some combination of your background and this place that matched that spark. However, I'm gonna guess that there's more than a few of you in the room today who have forgotten what that spark feels like. Amid all the homework and the deadlines and the finals and the projects, everybody talking about how hard it was and all that godforsaken math, you forgot what it was that drove you here in the first place. It's easy to do. I'm gonna tell you a story about a time that I actually forgot mine. Has anybody here spent any time on academic probation? You don't have to raise your hands, you don't want to, right? That's embarrassing, but I did. I did, it was following the winter quarter of my sophomore year. That year, my roommate was my best friend. We had met as freshmen the day before classes started freshman year. We were in Meese Hall, he had the room right next to mine, and we hit it off right away. We became the best of friends, we did all our schoolwork together, we hung out on the weekends together, we did everything together. We're still great friends to this day. He was the best man at my wedding, he's the godfather of one of my children, but in December that year, he came to me one day and he said, Jeff, I've decided Rose Holman is not for me. And he told me he was gonna transfer to a school in Iowa. So I went home for Christmas that year and when I came back from the break, of course, he wasn't there. And it was pretty disorienting, right? You guys know you become dependent on your friends. This was my very best friend at school and I was still trying to get my feet under me and readjust to what the new normal was gonna be. And then 19 days later, I got a call from my mom who told me that my grandmother had suddenly and unexpectedly passed away the evening before. Now my grandmother and I were very close. She wrote me handwritten letters every week while I was at school. I couldn't remember the last time I had seen her. I certainly didn't get a chance to say goodbye. She wasn't sick, or at least no one knew she was sick. And all of a sudden she was gone. And then in that moment, it felt like all of life was against me. I had this loss of my grandmother, my best friend wasn't there to talk to about it, and it was draining. I lost my focus, I didn't have motivation, my grades suffered, I dropped a class trying to make the load a little bit easier, I failed differential equations too, and I was struggling in another class called Data Structures, it was a computer science course and it was taught by Dr. Kerry Laxer. Now Dr. Laxer was also my academic advisor, he would later go on to lead the department, but at this time he was just one of those three professors I mentioned earlier. And so I went to his office and the door was open like it always was. And I knocked on the door jam and I said, Dr. Laxer, I've got a question about the homework. And he saw me and he's like, oh, hey, Jeff, come on in, sit down. And as I came in, he shut the door behind me. Now, I don't remember him ever shutting the door. I don't think he shut the door when he went home at night, right? So this was very startling, but I sat down and he turned and he said, so tell me what's going on. And I started to pull out the homework. And he said, no, no, no. Tell me what's going on with you personally. And I froze. I didn't know what to say. And after a few minutes, he said, look, I, I can tell you're struggling. Let me help. And so I told him. I told him about my roommate. I told him about my grandma. I told him how I dropped a class and it wasn't helping. I told him how I was thinking about dropping out, transferring, starting over, doing something easier. And then I lost it. I just started bawling in his office. And he came over and he gave me a hug. And after I calmed down, he asked if I wanted to go for a walk and I said that I did. So we headed out, it was the first week of February. It was overcast and gray and cold, like you guys know it is around here in February. Right. We walked for a long time, over an hour. I missed my next class, and I'm actually pretty sure Dr. Laxer missed his next class too. He asked me questions about my family and back home. I told him about my friends growing up. 
I told him how my dad and I used to build computers, about the small businesses I'd started as a kid. I even told him how my mom loved Broadway musicals, especially Phantom of the Opera and Cats. And then we walked a little further and he stopped and he smiled at me and he said, now how is it that we ended up talking about cats again? And I laughed, right? And the thing is, Dr. Laxer never once gave me any advice. He didn't tell me what to do. He simply asked me questions that reconnected me with my spark, that reminded me why I had come in the first place, the feeling of fun that I had when I told him about my dad and I building computers and starting those small companies, right? And that helped a lot. It helped a lot. I'm happy to say the very next quarter in the spring, I made the dean's list. I even got a B plus in differential equations too the second time around. I told you I love math, right? But here's the thing, this is the idea. The idea of reconnecting and revisiting your spark that I want to leave you with today. Years from now, you aren't going to remember who stood here speaking at your commencement, much less why I was invited. But I hope, I really hope, that you remember this. Because many of you are going to go on to become great engineers. Some of you will start businesses. They'll be doctors and lawyers. Some of you will become devoted stay-at-home moms and dads. Most of you will fill multiple of these roles over your lifetime. And when you least expect it, life is going to surprise you. And those surprises may dwarf the stress that you felt as a student here. Career problems, financial struggles, health scares, family issues, this happens to everybody. And when it does, when it feels like it's just insurmountable, stop for a moment and revisit that spark. Revisit what drives you from the inside, because that spark is yours and yours alone, and it's uniquely powerful in its ability to carry you forward. And don't just think of your own spark, look for ways where you might be able to help someone else connect with their spark too. Because who knows, maybe remembering your spark will carry you through those tough times. Maybe it will lead you right here to this stage 29 years from now, where you're going to share your story with the next generation of Rose grads. Or maybe one day, you'll simply take a walk, talk about Broadway musicals, and quietly help a struggling young person remember theirs. And that will be reward enough. Thank you very much. Keep your sparks alive, and congrats to the class of 2025. <laughs>